So let's talk about the ways that we can generate antibody reagents to tag molecules so that we can visualize them by fluorescence microscopy. So what we, we do here is we have some animal like a rabbit or a mouse or something and we can inject that rabbit or mouse with a protein that we're interested in studying. So let's say we're studying a human protein and let's pretend that human protein has, I don't know, we're, we're, we're schematically illustrating it with it as a triangle shaped protein. So this is some protein of interest, we'll call it a POI, the protein of interest. And we would like to be able to take cells and uh, look at where this protein of interest is found in cells. So we would like to be able to tag this protein. How do we do that? Well, we inject the protein into the rabbit and the rabbit will eventually produce antibodies. We'll just abbreviate that as ABS. And antibodies are Y-shaped molecules that have several subunits. And the tips of these antibodies are specific for a protein of interest. They will bind that protein of interest. Why? Well, the immune system recognizes this protein as a foreign invader, and the immune system of the injected animal mounts an antibody response, an, an immune response to that foreign invader, and produces lots of antibodies that will bind that protein. Now, let's say we have a tissue, and let's imagine that you know this tissue has different cells in it, we'll say lots of different cells. And let's just for the sake of interest say, oh, well, only a certain subset of cells contains this protein. Let's imagine that these cells right here contain that protein. That is, they're expressing the gene that encodes that protein, whereas the other cells aren't. Well, we can't just look at the tissue and discern that. We need to be able to use a tag that will allow us to tell, that will tell us whether or not that protein is present and in what cells it's present. So we, what we can do is take these antibodies derived from the injected rabbit and we will call these primary antibodies because they are the antibodies directed against our protein of interest. And we can incubate our tissue with those primary antibodies. So the primary antibodies will only bind to those cells which have the protein of interest. All right, wonderful. How do we tell that those primary antibodies are bound there? Well, what we do then is we use secondary antibodies, secondary antibodies that are directed against primary antibodies. So let's say this antibody was made in a rabbit. This primary antibody is a rabbit antibody. We can have secondary antibodies that are, let's say, that are made in a goat. Goat, and we'll call them anti-rabbit antibodies. So these goat anti-rabbit antibodies will bind any rabbit antibodies. Well, since the primary antibodies are rabbit, and they bind to these cells, a secondary antibody that is goat anti-rabbit will bind to those primary antibodies in those cells. And you might say, well, fine, but how do, how do we visualize that? The trick is that these the secondary antibodies can be coupled so here's our secondary antibody. Our secondary antibodies can be coupled to molecules that are fluorescent, that will fluoresce when a particular wavelength of light is shown upon them. So our secondary antibodies are bound to our primary antibodies. Our primary antibodies are only bound to cells or parts of cells that contain our protein of interest. And therefore, we will only see fluorescence from those cells that um, contain our protein of interest. So this is a way to tag molecules in cells or tissues with molecules, antibodies, and using primary and then secondary antibodies coupled to something that is fluorescent. We can then visualize by fluorescence where our protein of interest is found. So let's look at some examples of fluorescence microscopy. This is wide field micro fluorescence microscopy, and this was taken by a CLU student. And here what we're, we're visualizing is the distribution of a protein, actin, in the cell, and another protein that is found in the nucleus of the cell. And what we find is that the actin is concentrated at the periphery. So let's just focus on that right now, the periphery here, the periphery of the cells.
and we can see that the protein is concentrated there, but you'll notice that the image is rather blurry, and that is the case with most fluorescence, um, wide field fluorescence microscopy. There are two techniques that have been used to uh, sharpen up these images obtained with fluorescence microscopy. One technique is confocal microscopy, and you'll see this tissue now, same tissue as a wide field up here, visualized with confocal microscopy, and look at the resolution and the sharpness of the image. We'll talk about the technique of confocal microscopy in a minute. This is another example where mul multiple proteins are being visualized in a tissue. We have a protein that is tagged with green secondary antibodies, a protein that is tagged with red fluorescent secondary antibodies, and then the overlap is shown in yellow, where both green and red cells are expressing um, are expressing both proteins, so we see a yellow fluorescence, a combination of green and red there. And another technique is called deconvolution fluorescence microscopy, and we can see this here. Um, we can see that uh, in this case we get thick specimens, uh, we can visualize uh, thick volumes of cells and look at the distribution of molecules in them. And here we're seeing little structures in quite good detail that would not be resolved otherwise. And we can see that volume of tissue yeah, by rotating the, the uh, volume. And then we can see qu quite nicely the three-dimensional structure of this tissue using deconvolution microscopy. Deconvolution microscopy relies on a mathematical algorithm to reassign photons to their correct focal plane whereas confocal microscopy uses a physical technique that we'll talk about in a minute. So let's, let's talk about confocal microscopy. And we call, that is shorthand really for laser scanning confocal microscopy, or LSCM. So in order to resolve sharp images with, with, um, in fluorescence microscopy, what a confocal microscope does is it passes a thin pinhole over the specimen so that emitted light coming from secondary antibodies that are bound to the specimen, emitted light from only a single focal plane is obtained because other focal plane light will be excluded. And the problem with wide field fluorescence microscopy is that you're getting fluorescence from many different focal planes of the specimen, whereas confocal microscopy lets you resolve single focal planes and eliminate fluorescence coming from other focal planes in the specimen because specimens, even a single cell, has a thickness. So you're get, instead of getting um, uh, imaging all the fluorescence coming from all different levels in a cell or tissue, confocal microscopy allows you to resolve single focal planes and only see the light emitted by a single focal plane. And deconvolution microscopy accomplishes the sharpening of images in fluorescence microscopy by reassigning using a mathematical algorithm by reassigning photons to their correct focal plane. So you can see here that if this is the specimen and, and this is a particular focal plane that uh, we're interested in resolving, by passing a thin pinhole over the specimen we then exclude light that would be coming from out of focal plane depths in the tissue and only admit light to our detector which comes from a single focal plane. That is the power of laser scanning confocal microscopy and allows the images like this allows images like this to be obtained instead of images like that to be obtained. All right, let's continue on with our cell theory. So, all cells prokaryotic, eukaryotic, whatever it is you're talking about, have certain structures in common. One, of course, there's the genetic material. And in prokaryotes, the, the genetic material is found in a nucleoid, or a region of the cell. But in eukaryotes, the genetic material is partitioned in a double membrane organelle that we call the nucleus. We'll talk more about that shortly. And the rest of the cell is referred to as the cytoplasm, or a cytosol it's sometimes called which is a semi-fluid matrix chock full of molecules, as we'll mention shortly. And finally, all cells have a plasma membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer that we've already talked about, and that is what defines the boundary of a cell. Moving on to prokaryotic cells, uh, 
we know that prokaryotic cells, one of their distinguishing features is that their genetic material is not bound by a membrane. It's found in what we would call a nucleoid, a particular region of the cell, but there is not a membrane-bound nucleus. There's no phospholipid bilayer that partitions the, the genetic material in prokaryotic cells. Rather, it's present in a nucleoid. There are two major types of prokaryotes, as we've already mentioned, the archaea and the bacteria. And if we look at some of the features that prokaryotic cells possess, they have the genetic material in the nucleoid, they have a cytoplasm, they have a plasma membrane, and many of them have a cell wall. And they all contain ribosomes, which are the protein manufacturing factories, large macromolecular assemblages that are responsible for making the proteins of the cell. And there are no membrane organelles in, in prokaryotic cells. So here's an example a schematic of a bacterium, a prokaryotic cell. Uh, it has a uh, outer layer that is the capsule. Ca uh, often there are, uh, is an outer layer, even outside the cell wall. We'll call, the, call it the capsule, and that can be uh, a sugar coat. It can be um, basically polysaccharides or polymerized sugars. So we can have a sugar coat. Uh, emanating from that. We can have then inside of that we have a cell wall which can be made out of pepti peptidoglycans which are polysaccharides that are linked together by short stretches of protein. And then finally we have the plasma membrane which defines uh, the cell. And the plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. And then in the interior part of the bacterium we see the genetic material partitioned in a nucleoid. We have the cytoplasm containing ribosomes. Um, and this is a very simple schematic of a prokaryotic cell. You can see that there are, can be extensions of the cell called pili. And those pili can be used to fuse in some cases with other cells. Uh, some bacterial cells or some prokaryotic cells have flagella on them which allow them to swim. And the flagellum has a, is at, the, at its base has a molecular motor that drives the beating of the flagellum. Here is um, a micrograph showing a dividing bacterial cell. Um, this is one going to be one daughter cell. This is going to be the other daughter cell here. And you can kind of resolve the nucleoid in this micrograph. Now, if we focus in on the prokaryotic cell walls, they protect the cell and they maintain, maintain cell shape much like um, plant cell walls do for eukaryotes. Um, animal cells don't have cell walls. Eukaryotic plant cells do, and also prokaryotes have cell walls. So they maintain a rigidity and give the cell shape. For bacteria, they, as I've mentioned, they can, um, can be made out of peptidoglycans. And <clears throat> uh, the peptidoglycans, again, are, are long, sugar chains, polysaccharides joined or cross-linked by short peptides or proteins. And there is a stain that can be used to resolve different types of, of bacteria based on whether the stain binds to the peptidoglycan layer or whether, it, or whether it does not. Here is an example of the gram-positive bacteria. These are positive, this is gram-negative bacteria. And gram-negative bacteria have a thin layer of peptidoglycan, peptidoglycan between an inner membrane and an outer membrane that are both phospholipid bilayers. These are the negative, gram negatives, whereas gram positives have a phospholipid bilayer and then have a peptidoglycan thick cell wall, peptidoglycan. And those are the differences between gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Gram positive bacteria stain with a particular stain that allows them to be recognized as, as purple, whereas gram negatives do not stain with that purple dye. Now, archaea, the other uh, domain of life that we classify as prokaryotic, have cell walls, but those cell walls lack peptidoglycan.